Welcome to Nation in Conversation. I'm Theo Foster. The discussion today is about the size of a farm, scale, small farmer, big farmer. But before we get to this discussion, I'd like to welcome somebody very specially. Jaapi Grobler, it is uh, great to see you again here. Um, it's a privilege to have you and thank you very much for coming today. We really appreciate it. Just a bit of background. In the past, when we had these functions, we had a question time, and then afterwards, we said to the journalists they can stay behind. And all the regular agriculture journalists stayed behind, as well as the representative from the Karuakom Daily Dispatch. He was also there asking his questions. Yapi, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm going to... I'm going to start with my panel. Next to me is Wandile. Wandile friend. Why is that important? Yeah, it's important. Wandile friend, Sihlobo, means a friend. Your surname means a friend. Now, if any of you want to follow agriculture, agriculture trends, the agriculture industry, on social media, he is probably the best person to follow. Not only is he actual, he questions facts and he publishes reports almost on a daily basis. But what's your day job? No, the day job is not on Twitter. It's, uh, it's on the agriculture economics. I, I, I work for the Agriculture Business Chamber. Our focus is more on the policy-related stuff. But obviously, as an agriculture economist, I provide more of the research that underpins what we do. Wandile, thank you. And then Francois Strydom, who is the head of Senves. And Francois is the custodian of this nation in conversation. It was his idea. He's the figure behind it, and he's the reason why we have packed audiences and we discuss these topics on an annual basis. Francois, thank you very much, and thanks for your contribution. Thank you, Theo. It's a privilege. Thank Dr. Ferdi Meyer, everybody, when they talk about you, there's an acronym, and then we leave it. What do you do, Ferdi? Yeah, Theo, thanks. It's a BFAP. That stands for the Bureau for Food and Agriculture Policy. I'm also a professor at the University of Pretoria, and... Uh, BFAP was established 15 years ago, and our business is in outlook work, foresighting, and basically supporting decision making by policymakers and, and business in agriculture and agro processing. Now that you all know the panel, we are here on Yanni's farm. Yanni, thank you very much. Yanni de Villiers, um, I think a um, household name in the agriculture sector. Yanni, again, thank you very much. I think um, you talked about the numbers yesterday. It is incredible. It's an incredible event. Gets bigger every year. And thank you for hosting us and thank you for hosting this, this discussions. Thank you very much, Yanni. You're most welcome, yeah. Now, I want to start with you, Wandile. Is there statistics about the size of South African farms available? Uh, look, uh, there is a bit of statistics, but obviously some of it now is not so updated, and Ferdi will agree on that. But if you look at South Africa, we have data from 1900 that is a bit more accurate up until, say, the late 1990s or so. But if you read Fricky's PhD work, it is there up until 2011. But the key message is that the farm sizes in South Africa have changed over time. 1912, as you move in up until, say, 1998, roughly about 60% or so of the farms were at the range of around about 800 hectares uh, or so in size. But obviously, as we deregulate the markets, we started to see some bit of deviation. But in there also, there is a part that is usually unaccounted, which is the small-scale farming. But on average, yes, there, there is that uh, sort of information on the trend. So, so, so farms got smaller, and then at some points larger again? There are key factors that causes that because as farms were relatively small in the past, obviously there was a bit of government support that was there through subsidies, the labor market as well. There was a bit of a cheap labor that was supporting those farms. So we go to deregulation where everyone has to be competitive as we go to the world market. Then obviously there, that consolidation started to happen. And then farms started to get bigger, but that's not a local trend. I want to get Yanni is there any indication of the relative impact of farm size, GDP, and government support? Yeah, there's, there's good literature about that. Uh, you know, when we measure in the world what is the support that farmers are getting from different governments, we call it the PSEs, now the, the producer support equivalents. And when you plot those... Uh, so so that, this is the PSEs, 
is a, is a number that gives you an indication of the percentage support a farm as an entity receives from government. Correct. Yeah, the professor will be good with the definitions if you like. But So what we do is we've plotted that against, let's say, the farm size, for instance, or against the GDP that comes from, from that agricultural sector specifically. And, and what the data is showing is that the, the smaller the contribution from government to farming, the bigger the farms. You know, if you look at Australia, they've got very low PSE, but they've got huge farm sizes. But they've also got very good uh, GDP from that specifically. So if you look at Japan, they've got very small farm sizes, very huge government contribution. I think they had 48% of the farm income comes from government. So it's almost like they don't farm the land, they farm the government there. So 50% uh, so of the income is from the government. Correct. And that's why their farm sizes are small. Yeah. So, so in the South African context, sitting at a very low support from government, the only thing that farmers can do is to scale up to try and, and be competitive, as one Dilesh just said. I'm going to not go, come to you now, Ferdi, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that question and turn it on its head and, and actually do it the other way around. But that's not academically sound. So let me first ask um, Francho. The, we all talk about the big farming entities, but if we say that there's in South Africa a major portion of food is produced by smaller farming entities, where, what is the role of large-scale commercial farmers and where does the smaller farmer fit in? Yeah, Theo, I think so. you have to look at the whole picture. I think the facts are the following. We have about a million farmers, if you talk commercial, subsistence, small, developmental. In, in total about roughly a million farms. Roughly a million. Where does this 35,000 number that's being banded around commercial farmers, where does that fit into so that? So that's, that's the bigger commercial farmers, and those are typically the guys that produce a large amount of the, of the total food supply of South Africa and the member as well of, of SADC. So it's not only our 57.5 million people or citizens of South Africa, but also the SADC region, and then to a, a much bigger scale as well, exports to Europe and, and, and the rest of, of, of the world. So that's the, the, the continuum that you're seeing. About a million farmers producing to the South African population, SADC and the rest of the world. So I, I would argue it's not one or the other. Certainly in a commodity business and a typical commoditized business like maize production, scale is tremendously important. And as Yanni has pointed out, no support. So you have to um, leverage off size, technology, management systems, um, the whole continuum of, uh, of uh, uh, technology that's uh, available to be world competitive. Remember that commodities, as hard commodities and soft commodities, that price um, discovery mechanism is a worldwide mechanism, which means that a farmer is in day-to-day, second-to-second competition with all farmers across the globe because the price discovery mechanism is centralized. The, 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 that is almost the end price where, where, where goods are all derived from. But that's not always the price that, that the producer gets. If it's a small producer, it's very difficult to get to that market access. But, Ferdi, let's just go back to you. In terms of the, of the point that, that there is, there's a role for both big commercial farms as well as smaller farming entities, just an initial comment on that. Yeah, I think, Theo, what's, what's very important in South Africa, we must remember we have different value chains and different markets. And, and we have, we've been tracking in BFAB for about now 10 years, commercial farms, and you see where we benchmark them internationally. And you carefully consider what your production costs are per unit. So that's, at the end, what, what, what you guys are referring to is competition on the world market. We need to compete per unit of tons. So in other words, South African farm, at what cost base can you deliver a ton of maize or a, a kilogram of grapes, table grapes, or a kilogram of chicken meat onto the market and export it? And that's what the real competition is about, and you're correct. So saying the bigger your size gets, the better you have access or have ability to afford your technology and investments. And that's because of the margin? Correct. So those margins are tight, but just some very interesting numbers uh, from the research. Let's just take the chicken market, poultry producers. We have smallholder poultry producers delivering, selling a live bird at 50 rand a kilo. 
their feed costs, and we've carefully looked at their costing structure. Their costing structure is about 40, 50 percent higher, their costs per live bird, but they're getting about 50 rand for that live bird per kilo. If you go to your highly commercialized change, which most of us are in, in as consumers, and the highly processed, and you get those contract farmers, big farms, they've got a more efficient cost structure, but they get about 20, 23 rand per kilo of that bird. So you've got different value chains, but you're, we have to remember one thing, these commercialized value chains are going into the urban markets, and that's where we get a big pull in those urban value chains. So we've got different value chains, different markets, but your big markets and the growing markets are in the commercialized chains. We, we, have, we are very competitive and we have to be in this international open market. So some initial comments. Wandile, is the scale, some industries, as and I think specific maize and, and corn, is much more determined on size. Is there industries where there is more opportunity to, to support and assist small-scale or traditional farming, and, and can that happen? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, look, uh, the reality of it is the fact that we are living in Africa, South Africa is that, and like it or not, we have a dual economy. You have certain areas that are, in our markets, as developed as they are relative to the world, they still fragmented. Take, for example, there's someone who produces in the Transkai in Flagstaff, and there are consumers and the producers that are sitting in free state. So I think we, and considering that we are operating on a scarce resource, which is a limited one on a land. So in that perspective, I think that we can have both systems. Obviously, to feed the nation in a bigger scheme as well for export markets and stuff and to be food secure, you want to make sure that you have the commercial production, production side. But if you look at the small towns, Mr. Francois can't take Sanvest and go and calibrate it as is in Flagstaff, mainly because maybe economically it might not be viable and also the way that market is structured. Then for those small markets, you need to have small players that will produce a little bit of something, sell it to a local trader, and then it reaches the consumer. So I think that we might have both of them. And the last point is, Grain SA has done a great job on showing that because what they've focused on, on some of their, pro of their programs on a small one hectare, one small farm, they've boosted the yields of those small guys. So now they are able to have a little bit more, sell it to the market, buy a furniture and stuff. So that market needs to be nurtured and supported while at the same time we focus on making sure that we're growing. But I think we have a room for both of them at this stage in South Africa. I'm gonna come back the, yes. Yeah, I want to add to that, ne? for me, there was a shift in my mind when we started not talking or debating the scale big versus small, but can we get a commercial yield on every piece of land that we've got in this country because of the dual system that we've got, because we haven't got a market functioning in all these old homelands where there's no title deeds and there's no ownership. And, and under those circumstances, you need to change your, let almost say the hard economic fact thing and say let's just start of where we are let's get a commercial yield and and some of the people sitting in the audiences are busy doing that every day they just try to help that farmer use new technology because it's available even on your scale and let's just move them from a subsistence farmer to where he can at least sell something and and start making a living and growing from there francois if i take get technology and and obviously your the bulk of your client base is massive, successful, institutional, or not institutional, corporate farming, farming entity, big guys. Technology for them is very important in terms of the margin. But is it also not true that technology can actually make a massive difference in terms of the effectiveness and the scale of a small, small farmer? So it actually is, is, is important to you that uh, te technology has a much bigger effect on, on smaller farmers. Look, the, the bigger commercial operations, um, they wouldn't have been there if they weren't competitive all the time. So they've, they've sorted out and they kept abreast with all the developments. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been. It's just an in international phenomenon. But as uh, Yanni has pointed out, if you, if you come to a small or a medium-sized farmer where, um, uh, you know, per acre, it, it, the, the importance of that is, is becoming more and more relevant. The, the, the big difference that he can make is with technology, you know, with seed, with fertilizer. So it, it, it complements that part of the, of the uh, value chain even more.
And there the impact can be double or triple his current yield if done correctly. Ferdi, when Yanni talked about the relationship between small farmers and government assistance, and it seems that the more government assistance, the smaller farm becomes viable, obviously, in terms of the assistance. If you look at the structure, where, is, where are those opportunities? Yeah, Tio, I think we've been privileged to also track some of these for the Jobs Fund, for example, in these type of initiatives. Um, and, and we can clearly see where there is, it's a combination of your government support programs in terms of finances, but you need your mentorship. You need your mentorship from private sector, public sector, to, be, to form that partnership to drive these farms forward. And that's the reality that we're sitting with. Is I think we have a huge opportunity. If we think back at our national development plan, one third of our jobs that we identified in that national development plan is lying in the sector. Is are the small zero to 0 0.5 hectare, one hectare farms. And we can see that we've uh, looked at some of the statistics over the last three years. Where statistics South Africa, if you look at the rural households, their income from agriculture is less than 1% on average. If you look at these farms that we've mapped, we have about 5,000 of those smallholders where we're tracking their performance. And their income, household income, is about 30% of household income suddenly. We're not saying that they can only live off that one hectare. And we need to be realistic about that. You will not be able to sustain if your, your full family on just a one hectare farm, but you can supplement your food security status and your income. And that generates about 50% of that surplus production in those areas now suddenly comes into that value chain in that rural area. And suddenly you can get an off-taker. You can, you can market something, you can buy some inputs, and then you get your rural economies going. So I think that's where the opportunity lies. We have that land available, we've got those farmers available. The pity is just that we don't have good statistics on it. So if you look at the formal land census or the agriculture census, and Wandila referred to that as correct, it's 1998. And, and the, the problem is that we, any farm that's not registered for VAT, we don't really have accurate numbers on those. We only know some statistics on farmers who are registered for VAT. Anything below that we're missing in terms of real good numbers. So we, all, we work on a, f on a statistical base that we're actually uncertain. For me, if we talk about the production side, that's one element. But the value chain and making sure that the producer gets a market-related price, what can be done in that, th that area? Yeah, I, I think there, that's from the point that I made previously around the fragmentation of those markets. Because if you go, for example, now to the Eastern Cape, to some of the guys that were uh, helped through the Grain SA program, you do find that there are people who are struggling to have those goods reaching the market. If they will be able to do so, by the time they reach there, there's really no value that they can actually get. So part of the government support, I would say, though we argue for it to come in terms of uplifting them on skills bases and stuff, but I think the real one must be on infrastructure. Because those markets are there, Sanvers can't participate in there, partially, I'm not speaking on behalf of them, but partially because of the infrastructure basis that won't really allow you and any other agribusinesses to participate there. But if there could be all of that, I think now that pricing mechanism and the consolidation, and if we see a price in the stock exchange, maybe the farmer in Flagstaff in Bizana might see, might receive similar patterns if the infrastructure is, is, is fully upgraded. So Theo, I think we mustn't, mustn't underestimate the ingenuity of our farmers. I, I think the the, the first thing is if, you, if, if we grow a population that is government and state dependent, you know, we, we're on the wrong road. Um, that's the first point I, I want to make. And uh, if, if you look across all the different um, business uh, segments, I think food production is, is one of the, the segments of our society that has entrepreneurial skills and they find a way. So when dealer uh, refers to the Eastern Cape. We've just opened three branches in that area. Uh, a few interesting things. The first, of, so it's, it's the area of South Africa with the biggest rainfall. It's 1,200 millimeters in that Yugi Matlia area, millimeters per year. Second thing, the road infrastructure there is, is it, if it's not the best, it's amongst the best in South Africa. If every time I, I drive down there, they're constantly working on those roads. They're in excellent condition. 
second thing is there's interesting markets developing there because you have big aggregation of people in that Eastern Cape, that old Trans Transkei re region. And the farmers find ways to develop those markets. For instance, uh, uh, yellow maize production. Um, I met a guy there that delivers in excess of 2,000 tons per month into that area, and it's yellow maize. I, mean, I was amazed. I would have thought it would be white maize, but it's yellow maize. They, they grind it and form sort of a, a, a sludge pup and it's high sustenance uh, levels through that uh, liquefied uh, product. But for the farmer, what's, what's important, there's not a big uh, differential. So he uses what he sees around him. And, and those farmers are very, very successful. That's the one thing. The second thing is for the small, small scale farmer, the, the, the huge issue is market access. So aggregation of his product to reach the market is important. So this guy will you know, uh, consolidate the production of those smaller farmers and then through aggregation take it into those, those markets. I mean, another very good example is the uh, small-scale developmental wool farmers in that area. Brilliant story. That has now developed into, a, 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 I would say, a, a, you know, a, a market uh, that, that is, is, is world uh, class. Just on that point, I think it is... What I found interesting was if you look at, and, and I see there's quite a bit of written on the Muketsi market there near ZZ2 about how do you get small scale farmers access to the market without losing market price discounts. And Ferdi, let's, um, let's talk a term that's used in, in uh, when you come out of business school is low hanging fruit. So in terms of the low hanging fruit to create a flight path to the dripping roast. Is there certain farming produce that is more size neutral than others? And, and I want to steer back to the point that it might not be the whole income of the system, but it might add that 10 or 20 or 50,000 annual income to a system. Is there certain areas that's more um, conducive to be uh, size neutral, scale neutral? Absolutely. I, so I think your, your um, capital, capital investment, so we can be very specific about that, your more intensive, the more intensive your capital requirement is and the bigger, the longer the time period that you need to get your return on capital, the, the more difficult it becomes, then the size becomes a big an issue, bigger issue. But there are commodities like, especially in your vegetables, uh, your livestock, where you have relatively low levels of capital requirements needed and you can have a quick turnaround of cash. And it's not size dependent. Correct. You can have, it, uh, you know, your size, you can always, and, and that's again where the value chains come in. Which market do you deliver? If you want to deliver into your, um, you know, highly commercialized, um, uh, yeah, your retail chains, then you would re put up a big chicken house. If you're going to sell into your local street market uh, fresh chickens, your capital requirements much quicker, much quicker turnaround. The same for vegetables. So I think that's where the low-hanging fruits are lying, and we can see some of those companies that are putting up these warehouses, as as Francois was referring to, as the aggregators who are pulling pulling in this produce now, fresh produce, where you get these quick turnarounds. So those will be the first points of entry, and then here we'll get the then you'll get the evolution coming. If we can, if these small holders, these smaller farmers are competitive on a small base, then you can see them diversifying, getting into different crops, and you see this natural progression. And by the way, we can just look up north, you can look at Zambia, Ghana, those markets are shifting, and you can see textbook examples of the evolution, and farms are getting bigger in Africa. Uh, there are some statistics that are clearly indicating now that even in those areas, where you get an investment of an agribusiness in that area, some aggregator putting the produce together, and you see those farmers gradually getting bigger. Yanni, from an from a organized agriculture point of view, if we talk about these things, it seems that that, that grain, and or, or let's say the bigger grain market, is, not, is slightly more focused towards scale. But on your perspective, you are also having success not only in the big mega farms. Can you elaborate a bit on that? 
You know, I think if I just want to add to what Wendile said, for me, the infrastructure is still a, a, a hampering factor, uh, especially if you go into the deep rural areas. I mean, if we talk McClear and, and, and those areas, Yugi, there's a huge potential for us to grow on a commercial scale. But when you go a little bit deeper in where Wandilia comes from, you know, there you, the, the infrastructure is a problem. And the infrastructure is not just getting to the market. The infrastructure problem is getting the inputs to the farmers. So now they don't have access to fertilizer and chemicals and, and, and all these other uh, new technology stuff. And this is, this is also a hampering factor. So for me, there, there is an infrastructure thing. And the other thing is, too, when we work with, let's say, a one hectare or two hectare farmer, you can do it manually. I mean, it's hard labor, but, but this is what the people are doing. They plant by hand. It can be done. And, and they, yeah, and they harvest by hand. But the moment you want to go beyond like three hectares to five hectares, you need to start with mechanization. And I think this is where our problem is. There's no access to finance, you know, and, and, and this is what we need to resolve in terms of the land reform thing. If I, I don't know we don't want to go there, but this is, this is really the hampering thing. Our bigger black farmers are not entering the commercial level because of the financing constraints not having access uh, to, to mechanization. So we need that mechanization. So whilst we are continuing with the urbanization in this country, and if we look at the NDP, it shows us we, we continue with that. Those people are not going to be able to produce for themselves. Therefore, you need the scale to keep on doing that. But in the meanwhile, we need to help these people the, the very small ones to help themselves in terms of household food security, but there's a huge gap between these commercial farmers and that household food security that is for the past 20 years going nowhere. And this is something that we've identified that we need to pay serious attention to. This gap from our household food security, just explain a bit to me, where does that fit in and where is there opportunity in that space? No, I mean, look, uh, I think, I think the, 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 the fundamental thing to change uh, again and to transform people is in line with the, with the infrastructure story. Because I would say while there are small farms that do exist, I mean, we don't have evidence to say everybody wants to remain small, those that are in rural areas as we speak now. But I would say as you look at South Africa today, we somewhat need a combination of Holland and Brazil. You look at Brazil, they have small farmers, medium scale, commercial that you see in South Africa, then industrial or corporate farms. And in Holland, you'll find that there are small guys using very high tech, producing more of what Freddie was talking about on a, on a horticulture related stuff. And those guys are getting better yields and all of that stuff. So I would say much of the support that we need to put on is to channel more on increasing productivity of the small farms more than the land per se. Then once we have achieved the productivity space, we do that in line with making sure that there is infrastructure to deliver that way it's needed. And through that progression, I think that we might we might make progress, but we can't at a goal and say, look, we're taking small, <laughs> large farms or small farms. We need both of those working uh, hand in hand at this point. I think Brazil is a good example that uh, Wandila is, is citing. You know, around Sao, Sao Paulo is a lot of small scale farms and you have to support them through infrastructure financing, as, as uh, Yanni said, and aggregation. But in Brazil, there's also a guy that farms 343,000 hectares and he double crops on, on, on that. So from the very small to the, to the huge. And, and those guys are, are deep into the Mato Grosso, you know, where, where they're far from markets. So they obviously scale is very important. And it's the only way that you can, you can survive there. And that guy has, has built the whole infrastructure. He's built a town around his farm. It's, it's impressive to see that. Maybe to, just to add to that example, so if you look at Brazil, you can, uh, you can draw up an inverse graph, which one says scale, and the other one looks like this, which says value of crop per unit. And that's the inverse relationship that, you, uh, that Brazil is actually a good example of. So the lower the value per unit, like your, your soybeans and your maize, you need the scale, and the inverse relationship is then obviously your berries or your high value produce that you can you can reduce the unit size. So there you can have a nice example of it. With that example, does government realize this? I think so. I think there's generally a, an appreciation if one can put the right numbers and, and on one-on-one on -one discussions. I think there you have appreciation. 
uh, I think the broader audience is maybe it's not the, and maybe here, yeah, Wandili, you can also help. How do we bring this out to the broader audience and get an appreciation for those numbers? So if you have these one-on-one -on -one discussions and you, have, you present these numbers and, and we have hard facts and you say, this is, this is a story, and you can really see a difference in, in your socioeconomic impacts, your jobs, your rural areas, the economies that we've just been talking about, then there's a good appreciation for it. But to bring this message out, to package it correctly and bring it out to the wider audience, I think that's where we have a challenge. And we don't have the correct numbers to put out around the multipliers. If you would go to Treasury and say, this is what it's going to cost us, I think that's the number that we need to put on the table. And saying, this is the cost and this is the output. Correct. This is, this is, these are the cost benefit, do a cost benefit. If we would really scale this up and say, we understand what we need to do. Uh, and this is what's going to cost it. And these are the multipliers to the economy. Channel it in this direction. I think that's, the, that's, the, that's where we need to sit around a table and put it together. Francois, you, Senves is a commercial entity that needs to do the right thing for shareholders, for the business. When would something like this become attractive for you? Because obviously it is, a, it is not a traditional market for agriculture companies to get involved. When would it be attractive for you? So let, let me just try and start, I think, where the right place is for business. It's, it's not with shareholders. You start with a client. If, if you don't service your client, whether you're a, a church or a rugby club or a business, if you don't serve your client, there is no reason for your existence. So, and whatever that client wants and where the market is, that is where you should, you should, you should serve it. Um, you know, if, if we could just steer in, an, in another direction, if, if we pose the question now, is it good or bad that there's low subsidy levels in farming? Now, I would argue the biggest growth of South African farmers were in that period where sub subsidy were the lowest. That's where you get entrepreneurship. And whether you're big or small, that, that is true. So I'd, I'd rather go that road. I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't, I don't think we have to be um, despondent about that. As uh, I think Yanni referred to, in, in America, the subsidy levels for a grain farmer is 35 to 40 percent. And those farmers, they will typically refer to it, they're farming the bull. You know, where our farmers, they don't even talk about it. They, they work with what they have. They look at production factors, at eff effectivity, at um, technology. Those are the right things to, to concentrate to, to sustain um, your, your business over the, over the long time. And, and remember, it's a cyclical business. Two things, it's a, it's a fixed cost business, so you have high fixed costs, and it's a commodity, most of our, our agricultural products. So there's high cyclicality. You have to live through the, the bottom of that cycle. Everyone can live through the, through the ups, but you have to survive through the bottom of it. And I think if you, if you build up a resilient economy, which is not dependent on state, that is, is the best way to go. And surely that is our business model, Semvest, to sustain you know, self-sufficient farmers. Yanni, we are in South Africa in a position where, our, uh, and it came through all the discussions, poverty, inequality, and unemployment is one of our biggest challenges in South Africa. And a note that was made, which for me I wasn't aware of, but that 39% of the unemployed in South Africa actually has never held a permanent position. They never had the luxury or the honor of a job. Um, you talk about scale, and, and especially in, in your area, but scale has to do with mechanization, with cutting costs. That is not working towards providing employment. Um, your comments on that? Yeah, I, I'm a believer of the market, so I think the employment will follow because it is not necessarily primary sector that needs to do all of that. And, and I mean, BFAP has done a great job to identify to us exactly in which areas are, do we have growth potential and in which areas we are more labor intensive than not. Because agriculture still got that obligation to absorb a lot of these unemployed and unskilled people coming into agriculture, because the moment you increase your technology level, 
I mean, a tractor driver today must be a computer operator. He, he can't be, you know, somebody who knows where the flickers are. I mean, he must know how to touch the screen. This he is must what, also know where the flickers are. Uh, yeah, well, that's also important. <laughs> Maybe you should stay off the road. Anyway, but, uh, no, I, I think, so we are looking at a more advanced skilled person when it, let's say, come to the increased technology. But for me, and I think Fadi can, can maybe help us with that, the, the, the growth in our labor uptake as, as agriculture is, is in the, the horticulture sector, um, maybe a lot more than in grains, for instance. But the grains increases will be when we increase our chicken industry, when we go in the downstream industries, and there's a lot of, you know, these guys who have to catch the chickens or something. I mean, they don't need to be highly, you know, educated to, to do that sort of job. But, but, but we need to have the value addition. And, and we can't just focusing on exporting our maize to China or whoever the case may be. So for me, we, we must grow the economy first because before we get concerned about whether mechanization is going to take a few jobs out of, out of uh, if agriculture is not growing, the jobs are not growing. So it doesn't matter whether you mechanize or not. So, so we must get the GDP going in agriculture, and that will bring the jobs eventually, and hopefully more in the downstream. Just on that, I'm going to front shot this to you. I had an interesting discussion at lunch the other day with a farmer, and he said something happened to him that, that, that he would never have thought in his life would happen to him. He said, you, I said, what was it? He said, you know what? I've got technology and I've got some of this big equipment. One of my tractor drivers was headhunted. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is where you, uh, where you get towards they get headhunted. But Francois. So the point that Yanni is making in the poultry industry is, is a, a very important uh, example of that. I think with the balance there is now, of course, the, the poultry and all the intensive um, farming units are now you know, financially at a very good point. But what it leads to, and, and you could have seen that in the astral interim results that was announced this week, they're investing over a billion rand in capacity. And that is, is where the jobs come from. So it's not only ma maize production, but what happens to the maize through the cycle. And then the, the concomitant uh, production and, and job creation and wealth creation that, that flows from it. So, you know, it's never one of the production factors in isolation. Um, and, and maybe we should concentrate a bit more on, you know, what the whole system is. Because, you know, once you've produced, there is, a, a, it cuts through the whole economy. Because the financiers, the logistical people. We forget yeah. that long chain. Value chains. Yeah. So and, that's and, important. and all participants in that as a well. whole. Comment from your side? Yeah, no, no. I, I just wanted to add on the importance of maize that we shouldn't underplay that. And I mean, you would have seen in South Africa uh, two years back or three years back during that, uh, that drought period, most of the industries that, were, that depend on maize were actually highly exposed in there. Almost everyone that is in the house, the stuff that we use was actually exposed. You would have seen on the prices, on the linkages, on the jobs of space. So I think the importance of it, though in the farm level, might be small on a job basis. But when you look through the value chain, like you're saying, it, it's really key. Yeah. I think, to, uh, and, and going back on that, just to, to conclude the argument is it's not only the chickens, it's the crushing plants. Of soybean, so let's just do that little chain. It's it's two billion estimated capital investment in soybean crushing plants, creating that pool of local soybean production, investing in productivity at the farm level to get those beans as lowly priced as possible. And now, obviously, with producers, the higher their yields are, the more competitive they are. We can actually outcompete a Brazilian or an Argentinian landed soybean cake. That's what we're aiming for. So just to come back to the National Development Plan, one third of those jobs are in agro-processing down the value chain, not at the farm. So really, uh, to the, the, on these highly commercial, the, the maize and the soybean farms, we have to be realistic. They're not going to give us the multipliers, uh, the job multipliers at farm level, at the farm gate. They're going to give us beyond the farm gate. Then we've got the fruit industry, the high tech. And if we just look back at the last five, six years, look at the growth in citrus industry, look at growth in table grapes. We've actually gained market space in the international market. And those are labor intensive industries. So we are gaining space, market space, 
creating those jobs. So it's actually working. We just need to keep doing that and doing it better and putting more initiatives behind that. Look at the things that are working. In, in that point, that's where there's always, I don't want to open the, the, the land space. We are going to get there. We, <laughs> can't, we can't not get there. No, but, but the, the difficult, the reason... Yanni I'm also wants to get there. Uh, is, uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that on is that if you are looking for jobs and the industries that are growing and there's demand for growth on that, you know, there's demand for those products in the world market and stuff, and they are on the citrus related, and then you say, okay, on small scale farming, let's do the citrus. So can I plant my orange trees now and wait for them for the next couple of years if there's these uncertainty issues that comes about? So which then compels the small scale farmers to do more of the cash crops in situation. So I think that on hindering growth in, in, in that space gets to be, to, be, to be an issue. My take is that, and we've touched on it, in terms of getting access to funding, getting access to logistics, getting access to knowledge, the one element that, that continuously is circling around is the fact that that small-scale farmer doesn't have, he doesn't own the property. He has not got access to the formal financial system. He's not got access to the funding system. He can't get input finance. Therefore, this, the, the, on the input side, the system is hesitant to support him. On the other side, because his, his, his surety of tenure is not as fixed as it could be, there's elements of infrastructure provision. He almost, he or she, and there's a lot of cases it's a she, they almost live as second-class citizens without basic economic rights. To what extent is that a factor when we look at unlocking the potential there? Perhaps... Yeah, too. I think it's uh, it's a critical, it's a key factor. So, and that's what I was just to, uh, referring to now in terms of capital investment. No, so that's, are Yanni. Yeah, that is, those, those are no, the big the big issues. Is how, uh, how do you if you want to invest five hundred thousand rand a hectare to get that orchard, and it's going to take you five six years to get the returns on that five hundred six hundred thousand hectares. Whether you're black or white, small or large, it's the same principle. It's capital that goes in where you need returns and you need to service your debt. And the person who's going to borrow, uh, borrow you or lend you the money, they want the returns and there's a risk to it. So, and, and those are the practicalities that we need to think about if we want to get that growing. So that's a key bottleneck and then this uncertainty that Wandila is talking about, that already has an impact on the market now that we need to address. Is if capital starts to stop flow, to flow and to being invested, it already has an impact on your productivity and your expansion. Are you seeing capital change in capital allocation? So I think you know, and we can argue about uh, the the philosophy of, of of how your economy should be structured. It's, it's a long discussion. I believe in property rights as a basis of that. I, I believe in, in, in not a big support, but ingenuity, because that puts the you know the knife against your your throat and and that spurs you you know that constant pressure leverage in your balance sheet it spurs you to reach that hurdle rate and to perform and i think those are, are good things interesting what we see in our space that uh, the small to medium sized uh, farmer is hesitant he in terms of developing yep he listens to the the, the uncertainty but the bigger transactions, the deal flows are starting to come through there. But that also is a natural phenomenon. Um, and if you speak to the big financial institutions, they will tell you that from sort of mid-January mid to the end of January, deal flows are start starting to, to come through. And those are the, the first movers, the guys that sees the, the <coughs> world economy slowly turning, the South Africa economy slowly turning. We see the, the height of the the cycle of uh, soft commodity uh, the, the aggregation and where production is starting to normalize and to, to start pairing with uh, usage. So those guys are first movers and, the, and they're getting into the market. An interesting point is uh, just from, for, from being involved in Nation in Conversation the last <coughs> five, six years is the emphasis that a few years ago was purely on scale and it was almost that scale is the only relevant element and the rest is somewhere going to completely disappear one day. And it's strange how, how the logic of the discussion has moved to the importance of a smaller scale farmer coupled with the economy that has got, got both big and small. Yeah. 
we, we don't have the luxury in this country to let those tribal lands lie fallow. And we, we don't have the luxury for them to keep on producing one ton per hectare. It, it can't be that. If we look at the pace at which we're losing land in Mapumalanga because of mining, this country is going to be short of maize in the next five years. That means we're going to pay four and five thousand rand a ton where we're paying now two thousand rand a ton. And I'm talking now to the chickens and the, you know, all, all these downstream dairy and, 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 and uh, meat products and, and our own food. Do you, Francho, have a five-year maize future I can look at? <laughs> I, I, I certainly have a view on it, but not a future. <laughs> so, so, so the thing is, Ne, and, and this is what is, was encouraging, we, we haven't de debated in the land reform debate. We've never spoke about these tribal lands and the trusts and all these stuff. And all of a sudden, people brought that to the table and accepted it. Huh? You know, yeah, and that's, all, and, that and that's came for me on to this whole fantastic, argument. Fantastic. Is this South Africa? We need to talk about it. And we need to get it productive. And if the only way to get it productive is to get title deeds to people so that the market can do its job, then we need to talk about this. Because if we keep on avoiding it, we're going to sit with a crop of 9 million tons and 4,000 rand a price. And maybe the farmers will be happy, but I can tell you the consumers won't be happy. And that's where the big uptake is, what you were noting. The difference can be much bigger on, the, on, the, on that. I'm going to ask you, each of you, this exact same question. You walk out of here and your cell phone rings. And on the other side is President Ramaphosa. And he says to you, Mr. Nampu de Villiers, you are my new Minister of Agriculture. You will head up a cluster that will involve the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Rural Development, and you, the Minister of Agriculture. Please come back to me with a few basic first move policy instruments or policy decisions. What would you say, what would you prioritize as the first things that will make the biggest impact, Mr. De Villiers? Minister De Villiers. Waffle. There was like three De Villiers ministers already in this country. Now, <laughs> the, the first thing is title deeds to the black Rural farms. area title, title deeds. deeds. And the second thing is but the that, finance. That, that, that includes urban and Absolutely. Yeah. title deeds. Yeah, give the guy in the township his house, give him the title deed of that so that he can and start. And it's going to cost you nothing, but it's going to transfer a, a balance sheet item on him. Same thing applies to the rural areas. And, the and those deeds. black farmers that's currently on state-owned uh, uh, land, let them have the title deed. If they don't want to farm, let them sell it. So that the market can start working. And we, we are debating so much about is it the right beneficiary. Let him sell it off and let's move on with it. So I think that's the first thing, the title deed thing. And then just help so that the finance can, can flow as quickly as possible. And that will enlarge our production. It will immediately start creating jobs for us. Minister Mayer, I talked to... Um I thought I it have, was my portfolio. I have a candidate here. I have a candidate here who believes the solution is in, in that. What would your take be on that? Would you agree with him, and would you take the post? Yes, uh, Minister President, I would agree with him, and I would add uh, consolidate your Department of Rural Development, Land Reform, and, and Department of Agriculture. There should be one Wh department. Why is that? Because they are, uh, they are working in different spaces currently and they are not coordinating. There's a producer support, there's a lot of money and disconnect, uh, or a lot of money being wasted, funds being wasted that are not efficiently and effectively put at the right space, because they're all running different programs. So I would put those two departments together, sort out your title deeds, and get those two departments together, and, get, and then have one structured program with the partnerships in place. To drive. So if you have your, your, your ownership, your ten uh, security of tenure sorted out, you've got your departments actually delivering and with a coordinated program, we put some structure around where those programs are and you get those partnerships going, build strong partnerships. I, I would add two points to that saying, to the, to the ownership and title deed story, I would say the departments, that there needs to be effective service delivery and, and the, the, what the incentives, the policies that are driven to open up our markets and to get the producer support. Because without the producer support, and, and we need those government programs 
together with private sector to support these small other farmers to get them into the market. So those would buy two, two additional points. I'm just going to follow up something at this point. Is, uh, or, or is government, and I'm specifically talking about the broader both departments you talk about, are their decisions based on qualitative research or not? Um, that's a good question. I would say it's a hit and miss. It's a hit and miss. Some of them are based on uh, good qualitative assessments. Some of them, let's take a land audit. How long have we been asking for a land audit? Or a comprehensive agriculture census? Or the flyover data? And that's the point for you. So we, we uh, you know, for the last 10 years, those, those have been elements on the table saying, let's have a land audit. Let's, get the, let's figure out where these producers are that we need to support. And that's not happening. Uh, where we do have some nice evidence flowing and coming in is, for example, on uh, trade policies, where we've identified certain markets and where there was capacity and in partnership with private sector or the industry. They went into those markets and they opened up the markets and we could export into those markets, which is well done. So there are some of those success cases. But some of the key points especially around land ownership, around producer support programs, we, do, we have not based our policies on sound data and quantitative evidence. Francois, you get the call. And the, uh, the president says to you, um, Mr. Stradom, we have academics and we have agriculture talking to us about um, this position. But from a business perspective, what will unlock confidence for private public partnerships to assist me in this process, what do I need to do? Well, so I think if you look at the balance sheet of South Africa, there's a big unproductive asset lying there. And my first hit would be to award property rights to especially the guys in, in the urban areas. Because it's, a, it's debt capital lying there. Um, and if you af af afford them, and it's a huge number, around cities, around towns, afford property rights to those guys so that they can start accumulating and building wealth. Now it's a dead item on your balance sheet. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think the one thing that will facilitate the economy is if we fix Spoornet. And, and, a, and a shining example is, if, if you look at our current, at our grain farmers, how many kilograms of grain they produce per millimeter of rain they receive, they are world standard. So at farm level, at farm gate level, they, they're competitive. When you take that product to, to FOB, to, to uh, you know, priced at competitive level in the harbor, they're uncompetitive. So something gets lost. It's the logistical and, chain. And so even more gets lost on the smaller scale, guys. That's, that's even bigger. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is, I'll fix ESCOM, because that is still a huge production factor. So if you if you be able to, if you're able to to facilitate those three aspects, I think those are the low-hanging fruits. You have to be realistic, what is possible. And I think all of those things are practical and possible in the short term. Wandile, your call is slightly different because there's a condition on your call. You receive the call and you first have to agree on my condition before I carry on. Will you take over my social media? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I. If you were to given the opportunity to be Minister of Agriculture with Minister of Rural Development reporting into you and you've got the ear of DTI. No, I could employ them as my advisors and take all of that they say. <laughs> no, yeah. no, look. <laughs> no, I, I think the first thing is really on the point that Freddie was making, I would go for that. Uh, merge uh, part of the land reform guys as well as agriculture because that speaks to the post transfer support which we have seen not being effective uh, in a large scale over the past couple of years. Then after doing that, I would get Mr. De Villiers, the potato guys, fruit guys to provide the training and partner with them but take some of the capital that I used to use on training and deploy that on improving part of the infrastructure in the rural areas and the trade guys can also come on that. So I think if you have private sector, providing skills and training, 
you take the post-transfer support uh, to be aligned with what the agriculture is doing and improve infrastructure, which speaks to what uh, Francois was saying, that we, we, could see, we could see progress. Your view on, 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 on title deeds? On title deeds, oh, I forgot that. Uh, that's key. Uh, look, title deeds is key to prosperity. So. Do you, but are, are we allowed to ask you if you, the Minister of Agriculture, you've looked at us from the outside. You started here at NAMPO quite a few years ago. And I mean, you were, I know what you said in those days. So, so what is your take on this? Look, um, I'll give you my experience from viewing the discussions now and, and looking back at the past. The political discussion is still around. And I've got the feeling that we're moving closest to, to a solution. And I, why that's based on it is that if I interact with you guys and have the discussions that we had, it's almost like the fringes are falling off. It's almost like they're being left behind by this train. And it's almost coming back to the point that the discussions are rational, they're orderly, and they have in mind food security, giving more people access to the economy and increasing the investment in the agriculture sector. That's the first thing. The, the debate has, has centralized. That's number one. Number two, the questions being asked where there's criticism. They don't criticize the commercial farmer. They don't criticize the agriculture companies. The criticism is against a non-delivery by government. That has also changed. The criticism is non-delivery by government. And it's almost like, how can everybody assist us for government to fulfill their manner? That's the second point. The third point, I think, was noted that the segment of smaller traditional farmers has become a priority to solve. So that's, that's just from, from, from that perspective. Um, having the, the, the discussion where it is now, I think we are, there's underlying almost that, 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 that dead end is out of it. It's not a, there was a time when it was a, a, a not a crossroads, a T-junction. That's gone. We, we, we've taken the right turn in the T-junction, or left, whatever you are. We, taken, we turned in the, in the direction that we required to turn. The question now is, how do we take it from there? If I were to ask you, Francois, um, from, a, from a farming perspective, are we in a better place now than we were five years ago? So, I mean, that has a lot to do with uh, the pricing structure at that point. So, holistically, I would say, yes, we are at a better place. Look, some of our commodities are at, at that bottoming out. So, I can see our, our balance sheets moving sideways and further consolidation taking place. So, th but that's a snapshot. Um, we know that we're in a cyclical. Is the guys better equipped, at, uh, equipped to compete? Yes, definitely. Um, we need to, f to fix the infrastructure in the country. That is a huge, huge issue. And we have to focus on that. And you can see Praveen Gordon has cleaned up the uh, land bank. Uh, uh, sorry. Hopefully not. not. That, <laughs> that was get done there. eight years ago. <laughs> He's cleaned out in the effect, ESCOM. The land, cleaned out is, the land bank is probably one of the only SOEs in South Africa that's actually performing according to mandate and is a national asset, my view. So he's, he's, he's busy cleaning out those SOEs on both on board level and at managerial level. So you can see where the focus is. Um, you referred to uh, Minister Nene, whose key focus is to uh, create stability and surety. He wants the, the, the policy matters to be cleared out. They understand the economy, and that's why they're working it. And, and you have a, a very sane and rational president who is patient, who's not pushing issues which he, he shouldn't push. So we're at, the, at a very good space, and that, that bodes well for all sectors of the economy. I'm going to take that as your final comments. Are you comfortable with that? Just on that, you talk Nene being rational. If, if you really want to have a great idea of the thought process, Minister Nene visited the foreign investors in South Africa between the 12th and the 16th of March this year. He presented London, New York, Boston. There's a document on Treasury that he presented on the Treasury's website. If, if you're not sure about the quality of logic, go and read that presentation. It's an incredible, it's a proper presentation. That presentation says that if we get policy certainty, 
we can add permanent 0.4% to our GDP growth. And if you add a bit more certainty in specifically agriculture and uh, tourism, you can add an additional point too. Yanni, a final comment. I think for me too, just coming back to our title, the debate is not for me about big and small it's at the moment. It's not versus anymore. It's not versus. I would just say get the small on a commercial basis, whether it's one actor or ten actors or whatever the case may be. Uh, that means on a, on a yield, financially viable yield that... Y makes even if it's a small contribution. Yes, Tio, I want to add to that saying I think we're in a better space than five years ago. If we, if we look at the success that we've had with these programs, we now know that it can work. These PPPs can work. We've got examples. We can put them on the table say this is what works. Look at these examples. Look at these economies growing. Look what happens to an industry where there's capital investment due to policy certainty. And, and it can grow. We can actually displace other players in the international market. We can displace imports. We have invested in agro-processing. All these things are happening, but we need to continue with those. And we can only continue with those if we have policy certainty remaining with a clear plan. So I would say we're in a better space. Policy uncertainty-wise, that's where we need to play it now very careful and be very secure in terms of the message that we send out saying, guys, don't stop investing. Just make this go stronger, and this is the way that we're going to take it forward. What are you going to tweet right after this? <laughs> Look, I, I, I think we are in a, far, in, a, in, a better, in a better place now. And even some of the policy discussions that are providing uncert are causing uncertainty. But I think that the other way of looking at it is that now this is an opportunity or this is room for us to have a conversation as a country. And only if policymakers could be more willing to listen and the private sector be more, uh, bring forward some of the plans that they're having and make sure that we reflect on those plans. Either you are looking at land, but be more willing to take the outside input so that we may find uh, a workable solution. But central to that, is again the issue of title deeds across so that we have that investments. Farm sizes, I think we can live with all of those sizes like we listed, but we are, we are, we are in a better place. Thank you very much. I wonder how you can fit that into 144 characters, but uh, I want to thank my panel. Guys, thank you very much. I think this was a brilliant discussion. I think it again shows the fact that if we talk about the issues, there is issues that can be addressed. And thank you very much for your participation. Can we give them our hand? Thank you very much for joining us in this Nation in Conversation debate. I think it was interesting, it was enlightening, and I agree, there is light at the end of this tunnel. We have progressed, and we've realized that there's not a simple solution. We will have a few solutions, but we are getting there. Okay, um, any questions? Please put up your hand and state um, who you're from. There's a question there. <clears throat> Hi, Sabrina Dean, Farmers Weekly. Um, coming back to economy of scale, um, you did touch on it during the debate as well, but if we have to look at, you know, the whole concept of your, your smallholder farmer farming on smaller parcels of land, uh, we know, we've heard that can supplement household security. But if we were to go into a model of saying, let's do away with commercial farmers in a, a country like South Africa, let's just have everybody producing on smallholder farms. I know that that model does work in a lot of other, Afri or is employed in another, a lot of other African countries. Is it viable for national food security? Not for household food security, but for national food security for everybody to be producing at a small scale like that. Who would you like to answer that question? Because they're going to get quoted in the media as we carry on. Any one of our experts, actually. Um, uh, possibly uh, anybody, any one of them would be able to give insights. Right. So first one. OK. Minister Mayer. Uh, no, the answer is no. Uh, you know, you, we can't shift to a smallholder farmer base. And, and we need to look at these cases very carefully. <laughs> So uh, we'll, we'll go and recalculate those. We did a bit of an analysis uh, about two, three years ago where we looked at what, how much maize do you need to, 
to get the equivalent income of a minimum wage of a farm worker. It was around about 12 to 13 hectares. We can redo that. Uh, a mining worker was about 30 hectares. A taxi driver average income was about 50 to 60 hectares, if I remember correctly. Uh, and a middle um, salary level in the Department of Agriculture was about 700 to 800 hectares of maize. So those are just kind of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll redo those numbers and just make sure that they are correct. But just, just gives you a context of, that's the first point. Second point is carefully look at what's happening in Africa. It's going the other way, the other direction now. So you see in Zambia, we are having a transition from smallholder into medium scale. So the majority, where 10 years ago, in Zambia you had about 70 to 80% of food production coming from smallholders. It's now the medium scale. So medium scale is about 20 to 100. Those are the guys. And it's, it's, it's moving in that direction. Ghana, the same. Uganda, the same. Tanzania, starting with a trend. Kenya, still small, so you're correct. So it's, there are different case studies. It depends on your market. The reality, however, is that our value chains and our urbanization and the way that the evolution has worked determines or basically dictates that we need the commercial farmers to supply into those value chains. Perhaps part of that answer is then that if we have an urbanized, well-established value chain, like you walking into Willys, there's a different supplier required for that value chain. And I think that's also part of the, of the, but anybody else want to add anything? Just, uh, yeah, just, uh, just a quick, uh, just a quick uh, on the statistics and in Wandila, maybe you again looked at those numbers. The size of the eastern of France, where you guys are now in that market, is about a 300,000 ton market of maize meal, uh, or maize, and then maize meal equivalent in the Eastern Cape. That market, initially, you can have those smallholder farmers delivering first into the smaller units. Eventually, and they are probably better suited initially, and then you get your investment from the agro, from your, uh, agro processing companies on your infrastructure, and then the evolution starts. Yeah, so, so it might be different for another product, but if we want to talk food security of the basic commodities like grains, I mean, South Africa, and I think Botswana is the only sub-Sahara countries that's food secure at the moment. So, so it doesn't seem like, you know, if you, if you divide your country in just small pieces of land that you will be able to be food secure. And the higher you go with the urbanization, the more, you know. All right, further questions? Yes, there's a question there and then at the back. I'll take the first one in front, yeah. Hi, it's John Hudson from Nedbank. Um, it's, it's probably not really a question, but a comment, and, and I think it, uh, it fits in well with that market access. It will, development of the market, and I agree with the infrastructure challenges and all of that. But in some early uh, work being done by the WWF, for example, in some of the livestock areas, again in the, in the Eastern Cape, we're talking Matatiel, et cetera, where they've, they've created a market or they've uh, got mobile auction sites, um, which now then, uh, put, there's now a platform uh, for that livestock in that area. What we've noticed is that because that market is there, the farmers start to, to really understand the value of their product better. Because previously, they didn't know what the value was. There was no price mechanism to really guide them on that. And, and in a very short space of time, that has led to the improvement and the, in, in the efficiency and the productivity and the quality of that livestock coming through. And I suppose that, um, the challenge for us is how we then link that to the rest of the value chain. Um, you know, and, and if you can have that mobile uh, auction sites in the Eastern Cape, for example, and it does attract your buyers or your bigger feedlotters into that, that seems to be a natural pull and people then react to that. And I think Francois mentioned it, farmers are really good if there's the incentive there that they will react in that positive way. So, so maybe just a comment. Thank you for the comment. Value, anybody want to add anything to it? I think, thanks, great comment. Thank you very much. At the back. Theo Dani Minar, Boer Kroonstad. Ek um, wil daar paar opmerkings maak as raadgever van die minister van Landbouw. En uh, ek stem jyltemal saam met, met die beginsels wat hulle uitgewees het en die goed wat ons moet doen. En, en ons moet so min as moendlik in hierdie mar mark inmeng. Maar ek dink wat een minister van Landbouw in hierdie land verseker moet doen, is om na een droogte subsidie verzekeringsschema te kyk. 
die, die oomlik as ons dit daar stel, dan stel ons al die boere groot, klein, medium in staat om te kan produceren. Jy skep voedselsekuriteit, jy skep vir die industrie zekerheid in termen van productie en prijzen. Hij kan meer nijverhede daar stel, en ons is in die langtermijn ketang, al die werk wat ons moet genereer, gaan ons dan dier, dier die ketang genereer. Die tweede wat ik zal doen, ik zal agressief tarieven meer gebruik. Die, die koringindustrie in Zuid-Afrika het platgeval als gevolg van subsidies wat ander lande hulle, land, hulle, hulle boere gee. En door subsidie achter um, tarieven daar te stel, gaan je die markt daar stel dat ons 100% self-sufficient in koos gaan raak. Heideglik het ons sekere goed wat ons uitvoer in Zuid-Afrika en ons goed wat, wat ons invoer. Maar als ons ons tarieven daar recht stel, dan kan Zuid-Afrika 100% zelfvoorzienend in alle koos wees en dit skep zekerheid en dit skep werk. Thank you. I just, the, the point that I think is, uh, is almost all countries that are regarded as absolutely free market countries, US, India, most of the South American countries, have an underlying protection credit system of sorts. And I think that is something that, that, that we need that risk mitigation. I mean, there's even, if you just purely look at the makeup of South Africa, there's certain areas where the normal commercial insurers are not even, um, don't want to go. So they, there needs to be a, assistance there. Comment? Yeah, I, I think our regulated system was almost like an insurance. Now, when the minister made the prices and the maze board was in place and all of that, so, so you need, there, that wasn't needed to have, like, let's say, necessarily a crop insurance system from government because that was our crop insurance system. But since the deregulation, there was just nothing. So the market moved on, but what the market was telling us, the climate change is getting, you know, a bigger issue. The insurance doesn't want to necessarily go into the northwest province because of the higher risk. And for every hectare they do this side, they need to do like, you know, 50,000 on that side just to make their books balance. So, so what we are currently talking uh, as an industry jointly is to bring a proposal to government and to the minister and say, listen, we need a crop insurance system because it is not just to mitigate climate change stuff. It, it can also help a new farmer who has for the first time put everything, uh, you know, on, in the soil. And then it, when, when there's a drought, you know, he's, he's gone forever. So you need to have something to just give the guy a next chance. And, and, and we have been, there's some positive noises coming from our Minister of Finance about the possibility of something like this. And we, we need it. If we, if we think about the farmers that we visited in the U.S. the other day, that guy said, you know, we said, well, the prices are low. You're going to plant less this year. I said, no, no, same, same thing, you know, and the, because he's got 85% of uh, the country's crop insurance and the government's paying half of the premiums. I also would like to farm that way. Now. It's, you, you, you buy a baler to bail upside. money. You don't bail the cotton and all of those stuff. Any comment on the food security second point? So I think the crop insurance uh, suggestion that, that Donnie leaves is uh, it's something that we Do are... Do you listen to your advisor? It's, it's disaster management. And I think that's one of the... Uh, remember, we had in government a disaster management team that's been lacking for the last 20 years. And private sector has really taken up that position. You know, commodity organizations... Uh, Companies like uh, ourselves and, and, and many others have taken up that space. And, and farmers help each other. You, you've seen that in the last four or five years. If it weren't for farmers in certain areas, you know, others wouldn't have survived. So if, if you can relieve that through, and, and that's really an, an income hedge that you have, more than you know, a cr current crop insurance product, I think is outlived. It's old. It, uh, it should uh, it should dynamically and, and and you know I know that there's movement in that where they would rather hedge income uh, for that disaster, but uh, a state uh, subsidised system for that I, th I think is uh, is a sane product. Maybe just to add two points on this is uh, I don't know whether you know Bondila you might know this that the the lowest maize price in the world do you know where that is? It's Malawi currently. About $100 a ton. That's what maize is trading at in Malawi. Why? That's about 30% uh, below world prices. Lower than ours also. Why? Because there's a surplus production, there's no market, and they are basically landlocked. Where does this maize go? And that volatility last year, 
and then the year before that, the price was over 300 $350 a ton. So you get these huge cycles. So it's, it does knock out, if you don't have those insurance programs, your small smallholders are the first ones that are knocked out completely. You just can't handle it, first point. And then the second point, so it, yeah, so that's around uh, the, the, the crop insurance program. And if we can roll those programs out to the smallholders as well. And, and that's, that's where these insurance companies, private sector, uh, they've got certain norms from the back insurance. And, and that's again where government, we will have to have a look, how can we mitigate some of those elements? Because if you are as, uh, in the private sector business of, a, of an insurance company, you're not going to put out that risk. It's just too high and you've got your certain norms. So we can't expect it. We, it's just a it's a reality that we're facing in this country. And some, it's, a, it's a very good point. I agree. Will you cooling tariff, Brad? He asked something about Okay. Wheat Mechanism. Mechanism of the, of the wheat tariff is, is probably the biggest issue now also. Um, and it comes back to delivery and efficiency of departments. When is it announced? And, and if we carefully look at the imports, how they've been held back and suddenly Depends on whether you import the boat or book your book, do your booking of imports today or tomorrow because there's a big uncertainty on when this tariff will be announced. So, yes, there's an issue around the tariff, how big the subsidy needs to be in terms of all our tariff, our protection needs to be of the industry. First point. But second point is the mechanism. And the trigger mechanism currently is probably creating the biggest uncertainty in the market because you, if you are a miller, if you're importing, Today, tomorrow, you might be 1,000 rand a ton, well, not that extreme now, but about 300, 400 rand a ton out compared to your competitor. So there were companies last year that made a huge loss just because they timed the imports at the wrong time and the, the, the tariff was not announced at the, right, at the right time. So in other words, there's a problem with the mechanism of these announcements which causes another bottleneck in the system. I think on a tariff one, we, we need to maybe have some sort of timing to say if a tariff triggers on Friday, five days after that, it should actually be set in. If you sit with, today, for example, as I'm speaking to you, there's two that have actually been triggered, but there's nothing that has actually been uh, published on Government Gazette and then going to. What that does, it dries up the market. You had a period of about seven weeks or so without anything coming on in a country. Not to say that. I'm, I'm encouraging imports, but they were needed at this point. And I mean, you, 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 you're expecting to import close to 2 million tons. Right now, you're still around about 60% of that. And all of this creates uncertainty. It affects the profitability, like Freddie said. I think we have to have a time frame that when policy changes, steps should be followed. On the, on the tariff thing, I want to release an elephant in agriculture that very few people actually know about. When we, we impose an import duty on all products in South Africa, that money goes into a pool. And that pool of money, 90% of that income, goes to the BLNS countries, Botswana, Namibia, Swaziland, and Lesotho. It doesn't come to South Africa. So we are paying that import duty as consumers. The money goes into a pool and it goes to our neighboring countries. I was just thinking, if we can take, let's say, the wheat tariff, and we can take that 2 billion rand a year that, that we, we paid for, and put that into research, and get drought-tolerant varieties and higher-yielding varieties in place so that we can be less dependent on, on the world for imports, what a big difference would that make? And I'm not saying, you know, the king of Swaziland doesn't need another name and another wife and another car, but somehow South Africa need to manage that differently. I think we want to help our neighbors, but the way in which it is run at the moment, it's unfair and that needs a big revision. I think it's not only... The, just the Minister of Finance of Namibia will not like his counterpart I in know South Africa. That. Almost 30% of their income comes from the split, but yeah. I, th I think it's not only just unfair, but I think it's not productive for, uh, for us to have a tariff whereby we are protecting an industry, but we are not doing anything to really uplift and deal with the ills that are in between. So uh, regardless of how the, the, the revenue sharing will be, but I think there should be a pool for research that should uh, be notified. Y yeah, I'm going to allow one more question. Yes. Thanks. I'm Daninia Rasmus from Farmers Weekly. 
And um, I really just want to speak or ask about creating a conducive environment for entrepreneurship in which small-scale farmers will be encouraged to scale up either in size or in productivity. And um, I'm thinking about a comment that was made by one of the panel members, I can't remember who, that when commercial farmers in South Africa really grew and increased their size and productivity was when there was suddenly this vacuum of subsidies. So my question is about in what way does social grants replace a subsidy for small-scale farmers? Because I remember looking at research a month or two ago that in a certain area, small-scale farmers were deriving about 90% of their income from social grants. So is there a better way to um, administer social grants so that it acts as a, um, an inspiration for entrepreneurship rather than breeding greater dependence? And um, is this maybe a reason why so small-scale farmers in certain areas aren't acting as entrepreneurs because they, they know that they can rely on these social grants. Thank you very much. Can I, it's a difficult question, so perhaps, no, um, do you have yeah, anything on that? It, uh, so Denis, I think we can, we'll, we'll share with you the data that we have available. So we're trying, I, I think that's a very relevant question. So first of all, um, the day when those social grants are handed out in those rural areas, that's when the market flows. So it's, you cannot underestimate the market power that it creates, the buying power, those social grants in those markets just to say, okay, so, and, and the, basically the majority, um, I'll, we'll just carefully have to have a look at the stats, but it's around about 50% of the surplus that's produced by these rural farmers that we've just talked about now goes into those markets. That's where they're selling. Is there, so the, that, those social grants are creating a huge buying power in these rural areas. Uh, but I think you've made a very valid point. I think something to really go and have a look at to say, can you, can you um, apply these social grants more effectively and say, so can you channel it in such a way? But currently it's definitely giving the safety net. We just talked about insurance safety net. It's just definitely giving a market buying power safety net for a lot of those rural economies. Uh, just money being pumped in and people actually going to buy food or some trade taking place. But uh, it's a good question and we definitely need to look so, at it. So just to, am I getting you right? The 50% that's not going into the Steinhoff companies is going into the, um, no, it's, it's all of them there in a row. The, the, the pep stores and uh, you count them, they're all there. The other 50% actually goes into the rural agriculture sector. Is that it's the grain uh, to you. So the, in other words, the surplus grain, right. sorry, not their revenue. So it's, it's whatever is being sold into those. And we've got nice statistics on exactly this household. Uh, what does this household look like in terms of income? And we can compare that to income of a household that has no agriculture activity or very little. And then we can compare that. So I think it's a definitely worthwhile, that exercise, to understand thank you, thank those multipliers. So the no. data, thank you very much. Yeah, the data that we've given to Fadi was you know, the Treasury's interest, they, they're giving us a rent for rent on the job fund for, to this one hectare farm. And, eh? so, so they are looking at, will this four and a half thousand rand not generate more income to this guy than giving him a grant every year? Or maybe they can reduce the grant, you know, and, and, and try and generate uh, uh, economic activity that generates more money than just grants. Last point from your side. Yep, I think... Okay, I think the grants will help more on the demand pool, like you were saying. But the one thing that I, I want to highlight is that we cannot p take the grants as somewhat maybe replacing a sort of a subsidy. Because if you look at the age level of the people that are receiving grants, those are people that cannot farm. It's kids and the, and, and the senior people. So those people are the ones that help on a consumption side, creating a market for those small scale farmers. Thank you. Brilliant question. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks for attending. I think it is a brilliant panel. Let's give them another hand. And thank you very much.